Hey everyone, and uh, welcome to this quick presentation uh, showing some of the work I've been doing in Ruby to improve the level of concurrency you can achieve without changing your code very much. <laughs> um, so here's a really simple example. Uh, I want to do a Google search and I want to search for all of these topics and just print out how many times it showed up or something. So it's pretty kind of straightforward kind of thing to do. So let's uh, start off. So we're going to go through all the topics and then we're going to construct a URL. And I've got the base URL there for a Google search. And you should probably use a proper library to do this. But anyway, <laughs> this is fine for an example. And then we're going to reach to our trusty friend, uh, net HTTP get URL. And that just gives us a string for the body. And it's just sending request URL. Excellent. And so let's run then. Check that's working. Awesome. So that's working there. It's doing one at a time as we kind of expect, I guess. So wouldn't it be great if we could run all these requests, you know, at the same time simultaneously? Now you could go for threads if you wanted, and that would be a reasonable choice, I guess. Uh, except that if you wanted to do any um, processing of the data afterwards, you'd need to use a correct synchronization mechanism. Uh, <clears throat> and it's, strictly speaking, it's not necessary since this is, uh, the reason why this is slow is not because it's doing something computationally expensive, it's slow because it's waiting for data to go from my house in New Zealand across a fiber optic link to Google's data centers, probably in Sydney, um, which has about 100 to 200 milliseconds of latency. So. Uh, it's not that great. But you know, there's no reason why we couldn't run this simultaneously. Anyway, so let's just start off, we'll let's measure out the total time it's taking. Start at duration equals. And we'll kick that off again. Hopefully we get a time printed out. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, we'll work next time. So what I've been working on is using fibers to improve concurrency. And fibers alone don't solve this problem. This is the basic idea. What is wrong with my keyboard? Okay, so we're going to put this work inside of Fiber. And all a Fiber does is it allows you to schedule, uh, you, need, you can cooperatively schedule between different Fibers. So essentially, uh, if we wanted to run these requests concurrently, somewhere in the guts of here, it needs to say, I'm waiting on our IO, you can run a different fiber until that fiber waits on IO, and then run a different fiber until that fiber waits on, you know, and so on and so forth. So it's kind of round robining, uh, waiting for the IO events to uh, occur. So if we run this, nothing that exciting happens. Oh, actually, I don't want to run it there, I want to run it over here. It's still going to take about 10 seconds. So what I've been working on is the ability to hook into uh, the read and write methods in Ruby. So this is a class called buffered IO, and it's in the guts of the net HTTP implementation. And down here it has this method called 
uh, our buffer, which just means read buffer fill, and it's called. Uh, so this is a buffer. It tries to read as much as it can from the network. And then you can um, do things like I want to read a line or I want to read until something occurs or I want to read everything. And it will try and uh, read optimally from the network and return just the bits you're interested in. So this method here, what it does is it calls io.readnonblock. And that either returns the buffer or wait readable or wait writable. Um, typically you just expect the buffer or wait readable when you're doing read operations, but uh, OpenSSL can actually, internally it's doing encryption and it might actually need to wait for a writable event. But generally speaking, it's just those two you need to care about. And so what's happening in here is when the IO uh, would block because it's not readable yet, then we call wait readable. And essentially what I've implemented is a hook and that hook feeds that method into this thing called a scheduler. And the scheduler has a method called wait readable. And what it does is it basically uh, puts the current fiber into this hash table of IO to fibers. Then it calls uh, fiber.transfer. Now, when, it, when this comes back, so this is a control flow primitive, it's gonna go somewhere else, do some other fibers and once when this file descriptor becomes readable, it will come back. So then it deletes itself out of the readable hashtag, it's no longer waiting for it, and it just returns. So this fiber is actually the main fiber for the thread, and when you call it, you end up inside this uh, event processing loop. And what this event processing loop does is says, while there's anything readable, writable, or waiting, uh, call io.select, and then go through all the things that were readable, and transfer back to them, go through all the things that were writable and transfer back to them. And there's also some basic support for timer events. Now, in particular, uh, io.select has some limitations. So this is just used for tests and this is not a sort of production level scheduler. It's more like a proof of concept that is used for running the uh, Ruby test suite. Uh, for the real production level uh, battle hardened scheduler, there is one now included in an experimental branch of async uh, and that hooks into nio for r and it works pretty well in my limited testing so let's come back here and we have this code and now what we need to do is we need to create a scheduler so we're going to create that scheduler and then what we're going to do is we're going to tell the current thread to use that scheduler And finally, at the very end here, we're gonna call scheduler.run. And so what, what's roughly gonna happen is, we're gonna come in here, we're gonna send off uh, all of these requests. And then they're gonna to wait to read the response. And because the response will take about 100 to 200 milliseconds to come in, they're all gonna end up waiting in the event loop until those responses start coming in and then finally we'll get all the results coming at the, at the end. Uh, so let's go ahead and run that. What have I done wrong? Oh, I didn't save it. <laughs> there we go, that seems better. So what happened there was, uh, as soon as the request was written to the network, it tried to, to read um, the headers, from, or actually the, the response line, which is going to be HTTP 1.1 1 .1, uh, 200 OK or whatever, and then it's going to try and read the headers. And because the, the socket is um, not ready yet, uh, there's no data available in my computer's network uh, adapter, it is going to go into the scheduler, and the scheduler will run, and it will process all the other requests uh, until they're all waiting, and then eventually when the data comes in, it can process the response. And this is a little bit boring because we can't really see a response. There we go. So we went from about 10 seconds down to about half a second. And uh, that was really just by um, ensuring the thread had a scheduler 
and then wrapping your synchronous blocks of code inside fibers. So everything in here occurs synchronously. There's no um, nothing is there's no callbacks or you don't need to like worry about anything in terms of like waiting for something. And especially if this was um, buried in the guts of like you know Faraday something internally if Faraday is using the HTTP then it will just become non-blocking transparently. Uh, so it's quite quite a nice uh, abstraction to use from this in the sense that you don't actually have to change a huge amount of your code to use it unlike say callbacks or um, promises and so on. I guess the biggest downside would be that um, the flow control can change um, in the sense that even though it looks to you as if it's sequential, uh, this operation essentially becomes asynchronous. And what that means is if you have uh, some shared state, If you do something like this, um, you might get unexpected results because you took a copy of count into local count, and in the meantime, someone else could have adjusted count, and then you try and adjust it. So you just end up with typical race conditions can occur. Um, but if you're not using shared mutable state, then you can avoid these issues. So there we go. Count was always one. <laughs> it should have gone up, shouldn't it? But it didn't. So that's just the nature of um, asynchronous programming. And the same problems can occur with event-driven architectures. And so, you know, it's not particularly unique to this approach. But what I do like about this approach is there's very minimal changes required to your actual code. So to give you an example of um, how this might look in a real application, I actually I haven't prepared this before, so I'll just, you know, if you're running this inside Falcon, the web server that is based on async, and then if this pull request is merged into Ruby, and you write something like this, uh, this operation inside your middleware is, is not going to block request handling inside Falcon. Um, which, which means you can improve your concurrency for these kinds of operations. And this just isn't limited to net HTTP. Think about database queries, um, you know. Uh, I'm not sure how many people have been bitten by doing something like this in a database adapter, which tries to buffer everything. Um, and it's just a bit of a disaster if this query returns a million rows and you may want to actually do this incrementally and concurrently and not completely destroy your web server. So it's, a, it's nice from the point of view that in a theory code like this, which is largely isolated uh, with a scheduler and a web server that understands how to deal with uh, the scheduler, you will essentially derive improved performance. Yeah, so I'm pretty happy with it and uh, the next step is to just have a look at some of those race conditions and how we can minimize that. One thing we've been exploring is um, how do you handle mutexes? So if you do this, um, you can actually end up with a, well, we will end up with a deadlock, actually. We should end up with a deadlock. <laughs> uh, what have I done there that has not caused a deadlock? Oh, I didn't save it. There we go. So, um, what's happening here is we're locking the mutex in this fiber. And then this operation, because it's asynchronous, it's going to the scheduler. And the scheduler schedules another fiber to run. And so that fiber comes in here and tries to lock the same mutex again. So this is kind of a tricky problem to resolve because we would uh, like to minimize the 
impact on existing code that uses mutexes, but we also want to uh, avoid making mutex super complicated. And part of that, we've been thinking about making this an exclusive block. So when you lock a mutex on a, uh, on a thread with a scheduler, everything between here and here essentially becomes exclusive. So what that means is no other fiber will run during this, uh, during this, uh, between these two lines. The, the problem with that is that mutexes then become a tool for blocking your event loop, which you want to avoid. And the other option to consider is that a mutex uh, will only, is fiber aware and will only block the fiber that tries to lock it and other fibers can still execute. But that is much, much trickier to implement uh, when you start thinking about cross-thread scheduling uh, and <laughs> like fair scheduling and a variety of other issues that can show up. But anyway, so there is a simple solution, which is just to make this area exclusive. Um, and it doesn't preclude us from building a more elaborate uh, solution in the future for Ruby. So, you know, start simple, build something that works, and then uh, improve on it, iterate. I think that's the best approach here anyway. Anyway, thank you for watching. It was uh, pretty quick. I just wanted to give a quick demo of where I'm up to. And uh, yeah, it's really exciting. You know, potentially any any code inside Ruby that uses that buffered IO uh, implementation with the setup becomes non-blocking. So, I mean, I don't know which other ones use it, but let's imagine like NetSMTP, NetFTP, all those like different libraries potentially become uh, something which you can scale up really high. You know, if you need to have 50,000 SMTP connections or something, you know, in theory, uh, you, you could do it in one process. It becomes a, more about network throughput than the number of threads you can create or various other limitations. Excellent. Well, good night. <laughs>